Welcome back to the Weekly News Roundup. This is the Business and the Silly Ville Edition. This is recorded live Fridays, 9 p.m. Eastern at Standard Time. If you'd like to catch the show live, join in the regular chat, see all the fun things going on, watch me make mistakes in real time, and then start sweating. Go, ah. You know, I don't do that frequently, but, uh, you know. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and get diving right on into the news. We are going to start out with some Western digital nonsense. Anyone buying uh, any Western digital NAS drives? Uh, a friend of mine just bought some of these for uh, a new open media vault that he just put up uh, in his house. And uh, so they are basically engaging in purely predatory behavior. Of course, you know the the smart uh, readouts that they give you, and they'll give you warnings like our drives are starting to fail. Well, they program something in suggesting that if your drive's been on for more than three years, it starts sending warnings to you that it's about to fail. So the self-monitoring analysis and reporting technology data has been feeding back warning people about failures are possible in the disks that are only three years old. I mean, these mechanical hard drives, when treated properly, can last a long time. Like, a long time. I still, the very first hard drive I ever had and the very first computer I ever had still works. I have some old backed up data on it. It still works. It's slow as molasses, but it still functions. There's no bad sectors. You know, it, of course, it doesn't get used on a regular basis. It's, it hadn't gotten you. It has, it, I think it got maybe three or four, maybe five years of computer life. I think I had that one. I had that one actually all the way through college and into my first year of grad school. So I ran that computer for six years. Uh, same drive, no problems. The problem is they started rolling out some things uh, and suggesting the drives are going to fail, which scared people into replacing the dirt drives about every three years. User reported online the Syn uh, Synology focused and Synology on forums as well as on Reddit and YouTube. Western Digital Drives using Digital Device Analytics, WDDA. You're getting a warning stamp in Synology DSM once the power on count hits three year mark. Uh, it is similar to the smart monitoring system and the rival offerings like Seagate's Iron Wolf is supposed to provide analytics and ac um, actionable items. Recommended action says the drive has accumulated a large number of power on hours throughout the entire life of the drive. Please consider to replace the drive soon. There seems to be no discernible problems with the drive otherwise. So they're basically just scaring people into replacing them. Think planned obsolescence. We got to sell more hard drives, bring up that bottom line. And so that's really what they're doing. So that's pretty much all they're trying to do is they're just trying to get you to replace your drives more frequently in NAS systems. And um, yeah, that's kind of scummy of them. So if I have the choice between my Western Digital and my Seagate and they're equal priced, eh, that might steer me towards Seagate. I don't know. Uh, of course, the last ones I bought, was it the Maxis drive? Max drive? I forget which drive I just bought for the one laptop. That's been working great so far. So very pleased with that. That was an SSD purchase. All right, next up, a uh, cruise robo-taxi appears to hinder emergency crews after a mass bangy-bangy. So um, there was this blangy-blangy going on down, was this San Francisco? And the police get... Ryan on the scene and they come up on the robo taxi and of course the robo taxis when they detect police are supposed to pull over well the things like detects police so it just starts slowing down and then just kind of got in their way now um Cruz says the taxis pulled over and no emergency crews were hindered in any way. The, but the police say, no, we actually have footage of these stupid things hindering our progress to get to the scene. And uh, there is, there are, if you follow this link, I found which this link here, that's like posted video to, to Twitter, a cruise self-driving car seen on the road. This is not police camera footage showing they're blocked. This just shows there's police trying to pass by and there's a cruise in the camera frame. Uh, useless video, if you ask me. I looked at it a few times, staring at it, going, eh, I'm going make it, eh, whatever. Uh, so we left that one there. But the police are saying that the, the car, um, uh, they got behind it, the car goes to pull over, but it kind of pulled over in a way that they couldn't really get around it. Because the thing thought, thought it was getting pulled over by the police. See, this is the problem with these self-driving systems. A human being can gain some insight in the idea. Like, you go to pull over, and the cop doesn't pull over behind you. You kind of know, okay, you're not the one pulling over. Let your adrenaline go back down and move over a little bit more and let him pass. Okay? 
you got to have these a little bit of discerning items. Whereas if it is Pat pulling you over, you start slowing down, pulling over. He just kind of mirrors what you do. Well, the cruise doesn't understand that distinction and it thought he was getting pulled over and just decided to sit there in the road like a, a rotten potato or something. And so it does raise more questions about these stupid self-driving cars. Fascinating uh, read there. Your Pixel phone now has a safety check that will tell your friends where you are. I'm looking at this going, you know what? As much as I'm not a huge fan of this type of technology, I understand why this is, but I still think it's a poor implementation. Because I prefer a more hands-on approach, not a more hands-off approach. Now, this is for specific times. You're meeting somebody in a strange place, meeting somebody you don't know, going out on a first date. It certainly is wise to let somebody know and I like I do this if I'm buying or selling something on Craigslist. Now, the problem is, is this is a hands-off approach. And I don't like the hands-off approach because you push a button. And it's a hands-off approach. If you do not respond to the phone's prompt in, you know, an hour's time, it's going to text your location or your phone's location rather to your friends on your contact list. Well, what if your friends on your contact list are kind of like me? I, I haven't touched my phone, but twice today, uh, I don't know if anybody's actually texted me or whatever else. Uh, you know, if your friends are not a perpetually attached to their phone, that's not really useful information. But when I'm meeting somebody out, I will have one or two specific friends. I'll call one of them up. I'll be like, hey, I'm going to such and such a place. I'm meeting such and such a person for such and such a time. Uh, just letting you know, and I'll call you when I'm done. That way, if I end up, you know, missing, dead in a ditch, somebody knows and has received information first. So I don't like the passiveness of this where you just boot up the option and push it on your phone. Oh, there you go. Push the button on the phone. And if you don't respond to something, it immediately texts your friends or whatever else. And I see, I don't like this issue because it's too passive. It doesn't give you an active role in everything going on. And we should have the more active role in what's going on. So, but at the same time, I do understand it. It is a neat thing. It, it'd be a good thing if you, you take a proactive role, text somebody in advance, hey, I'm going such and such a place, such and such and whatever. Uh, confirm that they're watching their phone, push the button. I get that. I completely get that. So this one's another one of those ones. I'm kind of on the fence. I don't know if I completely love this, completely hate this. It's not something I would specifically use, but I completely understand where and how it's coming from. Absolutely. So with that, um, uh, with that, you know, it, it's going to work out, work out pretty well. So let me know in the comments what you think about that one. And Microsoft is selling screens, batteries, SSDs, and more. Of course, the Ars Technica actually had pricey DIY surface repairs in the uh, URL. It didn't specifically mention super priciness factors, other than the fact that the screen they're selling you is $1,700 all by itself, which is like I've repaired, I've repaired laptop screens. Your typical laptop laptop screen costs less than a hundred dollars. So this is that. Of course, it's cheaper than the computer all by itself. They're making the devices easy to take apart. They're making the tools available. They're making all of the manuals available. I'm sure Luce Rossman might have talked about this, but I haven't seen it pop up in my feed, and I didn't actively go out looking for it. So I'm not completely sure if he did. Uh, maybe this is just a sham. But at least they're making an effort in that they micro. Microsoft is making manuals available. They're telling you go to iFixit and pick up their you know their basic toolkit is all you need to replace everything. And when you buy components for repairs, you're getting the minor accessories. So if you got to take out five screws to, to replace the screen, they're going to give you the screen and they're also going to give you five new screws. You can replace the SD cards. Most of the components, they're making these highly repairable. I think this is a good step. I, I still would not buy a Microsoft Surface product. I think they're uh, way overpriced and I just can't get behind the company. But with that being said, I love the fact that they are releasing products that can be repaired. This is the number one reason I like Dell computers. 
Dell makes all of the parts and accessories and manuals available to repair their laptops and other computers. So for me, I like that fact because in my case, I look at this and go, okay, I know I get a computer that if it breaks down, I have a very good chance of being able to fix stuff. That's a positive here. Uh, is it overly expensive? Uh, I mean, I think $1,700 for a monitor is over expensive, but is this like Apple's doing where it's like the whole top case with everything all involved, in which case it's overkill, but at least they're making a little bit of an effort, at least on the surface. You can also upgrade your SSDs, so if you bought the lower um, the the lower memory model you can buy now the upgraded models and um, uh, basically have the have the upgrade uh, advantage of the upgrade of models and so that's actually pretty good stuff so curious to see where this goes is going to be a really good deal is this going to be a really bad deal that i don't know it's interesting uh to see and you know we'll see what this turns into a little bit down the road and uh i'll keep an eye out you should keep an eye out as well for a uh, lewis rossman uh diy uh right to repair microsoft stuff so is microsoft supporting right to repair and almost looks on the surface like it would uh does this mean i'm gonna buy them no i just can't get behind that company but uh that's me <laughs> Well, if you want to help support the channel, we do have affiliates. Today we're highlighting A2 Hosting if you happen to need web hosting. Uh, A2 Hosting is where I hosted a lot of my client sites for a long time. Uh, and the only reason I'm there, not there right now is I have way too many sites and I manage all that stuff with personal licenses uh, through Linode and uh, other servers like that. But still, I still refer a lot of people over to A2 Hosting. They have good functioning sites. They do work pretty well. You can use my affiliate link there, tlm.li forward slash A2H, and that is going to get you everything that you need for getting a website up and running. With that, let's head on over to your favorite place and mine, Sillyville. All right, first up in Sillyville, Paul McCartney uses AI to make a new Beatles song. So for all you guys who are like, Beatlemania, they're the best! Help Help uh, if that's you, then uh, you will be very happy to know that there is a brand new Beatles song, never been heard, because... A Beatle made it with AI generation. How wonderful. Is that making a Beatles song or does that make it an open AI song? So um, there you have it. AI generated music is a burgeoning and fraught topic. The artists either vocally opposing or even faintest hint of it or some like Grimes more or less embracing it completely. Now Paul McCartney seems to be on the pro train at least as part as he's created a new Beatles song using AI and it will be replaced released to the public later this year. It includes John Lennon vocals pulled from an old demo recording. BBC report uh, that the first revealed the news says it's probably from now and then a 1978 Lennon recording, which was recorded to cassette from Lennon's living room in New York City just before his blangy blangs. The inspiration came from the song from Peter Jackson's documentary, Get Back. McCartney told the BBC, since for that process, a custom AI system was used to separate the vocals of the various Beatles members from background noises and enabling high quality reproduction. So stay tuned for that uh, new Beatles song. Um, uncont you know, very controversial opinion. I don't really care for the Beatles, so um, I, I won't be sitting on the edge of my seat waiting for that to come out. <clears throat> And otherwise, uh, if you happen to have that old Atari 2600 laying around, a brand new uh, Atari game is being released for it. <laughs> That's right. So the company, a company called Atari is releasing a brand new 2600 cartridge later this year. Today's Atari could hardly have less to do with one of the release VCSs. Now, is this necessarily the Atari company? Uh, um, they currently own the Atari name and trademarks, decided to give owners of the old Atari video game system, a.k.a. the Atari 2600, something new to do. Mr. Run and Jump is a new Atari published platformer that is coming to vintage Atari consoles in the cartridge form. Complete with box and instruction manual, pre-orders for the cartridge begin July 31st for $60. Holy crap. I mean, the whole Atari was under 50 bucks. <laughs> Talk about inflation. My lance. 
<laughs> so the version of Mr. Run and Jump coming to 2600 is a primitive version of a much different looking game. The same name that's coming to PCs and all major gaming consoles on July 25th. So got to hand it to Atari here. Now, if you guys didn't know, uh, fun fun little trivia. I'll just mention this very briefly. I, I covered this in fine detail in my book, I Am Not Amused, where I cover media entertainment and things. Atari's big problem, what really caused a lot of its downfall, is that they allowed anybody to produce games for their system, which actually led to sexually explicit and nearly pornographic video games for Atari. And that is precisely why Nintendo tightly licensed everything and required a Nintendo seal on anything that went out, and they aggressively fought that. A fun little information if you want to hear more about it. It's in my book, I Am Not Amused. Get it anywhere you can pick up books. And on to, um, let's see, not our last one, but uh, this one came from Dan, actually, uh, and all you Linux guys that like playing American Truck Simulator. So American Truck Simulator players are now being targeted by in-game recruitment ads from a massive trucking company. So <laughs> there's all these ads on uh, billboards, make the switch uh, to is it Schneider, right? Uh, so basically, uh, and this is a real company, they're actually putting real ads inside of the game trying to recruit truck drivers. So I think this is brilliant. I, I just uh, I just thought it was uh, it was good. So hard to explain the appeal of various truck simulator games to someone who hasn't played them. Now, uh, what Dan says um, is that like it, they've really done a good job of make, really making it feel like you're actually driving a big rig. So uh, that's kind of neat. And it does look pretty cool as I see the graphics uh, from it. So it's kind of neat. So if you're playing that, keep an eye out for all of the uh, trucking companies that are advertising to you. And, um, you know, if you're looking for a new job as a truck driver, of course, start with your truck driver simulator, see how you like it, and then uh, maybe go for the real thing. Um, help, uh, help keep jobs in, in the country. There you go. And on to our final article in Sillyville today. Comcast complains to the FCC that listing all of its monthly fees is just too hard. <laughs> so, uh, of course, Comcast, uh, there's a new FCC ruling that required cable companies to list all fees. Nothing hidden. In fact, they were creating this, this fee, um, um, basically nutrition label following the look of the nutrition label with the monthly prices and all the basic charges, terms, and services. And what they're basically saying is, hey, ours looks like a multivitamin, man. There's too many fees in here. We're looking for loopholes so that we do not have to disclose all of our fees. Comcast is not happy about the new federal rules. We're required to provide broadband customers with labels displaying exact prices and other information about Internet service plans. In a filing last week, Comcast told the FCC it's working diligently to put in place the systems and processes necessary to create, maintain, and display the labels as required. But according to Comcast, two aspects of the commission's order impose significant administrative burdens and unnecessary complexity in complying with the broadband label requirements. They noted that five major cable and telecom industry trade groups petitioned the FTC in January to change the rules. Comcast's new filing urged the FCC to grant the petition as soon as possible before the rules become effective to help providers streamline and simplify their labeling measures, which will ultimately benefit customers. So Comcast is coming out. We just can't even do it, man. We can't do it. Uh, they don't want to list all the fees. Let's see. Comcast pointed to the recent filings regarding the commissioner's understating and burdens associations with the implemented the broadband consumer rules. Filings came from Verizon, AT&T Lumen, a.k.a. CenturyLink, and a trade group representing the rural broadband providers. Um, they have annoyed customers for many years by advertising low prices and then charging large monthly bills, tacking on the various fees. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Uh, so there you have it, guys. You can uh, you can read all about Comcast seeking loopholes to make sure that they do not actually have to display all their fees. Uh, very fascinating indeed. So uh, let me know. Uh, are you forced to use uh, them because you absolutely have no other choice? <laughs> let me know. If you want to help support the channel, we do have a locals page. Locals, uh, switch to linux.locals.com. Jump in on over there, help support the community, and uh, we have some other stuff over there from time to time as well. With that, thank you for watching, and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux. 
Thank you for watching this video from Switched to Linux. This channel would not be possible without the backing of the program supporters scrolling on the screen now. You can be a supporter at Patreon at patreon.com slash t-o-m-m or at thinklifemedia.com. I also want to thank the open source community who creates such excellent software that makes producing this show possible. Please remember to support your software communities. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux.